for many years. Um, I'm really interested in the, the origins of the culture of crime and how that can be um, retained and, and kind of reset and renewed and how relevant it is to the future of wine. Um, my day job is that I run a marketing company called Spoil, but um, I co-founded a non-profit as a lockdown project called the Old Vine Conference, which is about showing that old vineyards, heritage viticulture, actually is a, a sort of a viable category and a really powerful way to talk about wine and farming in wine and the agriculture of wine as part of wine culture. As part of that Old Land Conference, we partnered with a great organisation called the IWSC Foundation. This is the charitable arm of the International Wine Spirit Competition, um, which was set up under the direction of um, Christelle Hubert and the owners of the IWSC Foundation to donate um, funds to projects within wine that um, contribute to the sustainability and the diversity of the wine sector. So, the IWSC Foundation actually were one of the old wine conferences first um, institutional sponsors and one of the things we wanted to do about the old wine conference was as well as all the marketing stuff, you know, all the pizzazz on the tasting, to highlight the great wines, is also to encourage research into heritage vineyards and heritage viticulture and the varieties that are then recuperated through that. So the IWSC Foundation actually gave us a grant and after a lot of, um, um, sort of searching and discussions, we basically worked with um, Heritage Vineyards of Turkey, who you're about to hear from soon, and through the IWSC we were able to fund this research that they're about to talk to you, talk to you through today. And the research isn't just academic, it is academic, as you'll see they partnered with very credible academic partners, but I think it's really important that we make these, um, this research live. You know, because actually, um, a heritage vineyard, if it's not in a bottle being sold and loved, um, and that love translating into a higher price, we lose um, this diversity of its culture and the culture that goes behind it. So um, you can see more about the Old Wine Conference um, at our website, but I really want to hand over now to Bochem and Umai and the other members I know of the Heritage um, United <laughs> Turkey team, who are also fabulous and you must introduce each other, um, who are going to take you through um, their organisation. Um, the organisation existed beforehand and we were just able to really give this um, a focus, a boost, and, and the results of the research they're going to talk you through, and then the fruits, the delicious, drinkable fruits of that research are in front of you. So, I think that's everything for me. Yep. I, I don't think so, right. <laughs> I'll hand over to you. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you to the Point Conference and the WBSC Foundation for the opportunity. Without you, we would not be able to do this research uh, in 2002. So this is a first for Turkey, because for the first time actually, uh, different wineries collaborated uh, for a project. So the wines you are about to taste are all fresh, uh, coming from 2022. And apart from number one, uh, they are all tank samples. Only number one was released. So in the other room, we have a walk around tasting, where you will see all the versions of the, this variety called uh, Maybe just before you start, uh, I should tell uh, about the Heritage Wines of Turkey. This is like an initiative of volunteers. We are all partners of uh, different professionals, but we are still very committed to our uh, culture and the viticulture uh, of vineyards in Turkey. It's something which is very rare and unknown, yet it's very, very uh, lives for, I think, more than thousands of years. So we try to record, uh, reveal the you know what is unknown, and uh, increase awareness for uh, the old wines of uh, Turkey, which is I think very unique and not seen from the maybe total image of under Turkey. So uh, I mean we will keep doing this, but this research basically, which was funded uh, by IWC and thanks to Old Wine Conference, 
is find something like a blueprint for us because there are so many different areas which we're going to maybe taste here as an example and we really want to carry on in the uh, next room with the following so many different varieties uh, and th that's how it starts. Yeah, and when it is Turkey, I mean the, the figures, the numbers are quite misleading because this area, this region is uh, quite unknown to even many wine professionals, uh, consumers in Turkey. It's a very small region in Turkish standards, but there are 1,000 hectares of vineyards of this variety existing. But 10 years ago, it was 2,000. So we are losing them in a very uh, fast pace. So uh, we uh, will be talking about this region in particular in the master class. There are reasons why we focus on this region. Uh, but uh, we hope that this the highlights, the resource findings will uh, shed a light on the rest of Turkey that you will be facing in the other room. So uh, a bit of history to uh, bring some context. Uh, the word old uh, has other uh, meanings when it is Turkey. Uh, because uh, it's not only the wines uh, that are old, but uh, I mean, uh, all the traditions, the history, it is all there. I mean, all the pictures you see are uh, were taken uh, within the vineyards, actually. Uh, because, uh, as you all know, uh, especially southeastern Turkey is one of the uh, areas where the grapevine was first domesticated and then spread to the rest of the Western world. And all the uh, civilizations that inhabited what we call Anatolia were uh, growing grapes and making wine out of them, including the Hittites, the Urartians, the Pyrrhidians, then the Hellenistic period, uh, the Byzantines, and then the Ottomans, of course. Uh, when the Turks uh, conquered Anatolia in 1071, they were already Muslims. So uh, the alcohol consumption is always, and it still is, uh, a political issue in Turkey. So, during the Ottoman times, uh, all the non-Muslim communities were allowed to make wine, uh, pursue its trade, uh, but the Muslim community were uh, prohibited from using it. But uh, when you are walking through vineyards, I mean, it's all there. For example, this is a vineyard in Urla, and when they were just organizing the terraces, they found all these clay vessels buried underground from the Greek times. Uh, this is another... Uh, drug cards, press, uh, just within the vineyard in Tromele. And my number 44 in the other room is coming from these vineyards. So uh, old is really old when it is Turkey. Uh, during the time of the Republic, uh, there were constructive efforts to uh, boost winemaking by the new uh, Turkish Republic. And there was uh, the Tekke. Uh, which is the uh, government institute that was uh, collecting all the grapes from the farmers and making wine out of it, but private enterprise was also allowed to make wine. Uh, then came the current government in 2002. Uh, so uh, it's a very Islamist, uh, conservative government, and uh, they keep pushing uh, prohibitions and bans on the consumption of alcohol, and the one in 2013 uh, was uh, the strictest yet, because it is almost a cocktail of all the bands from all around the world. So you cannot criticize it. When you criticize, why do we have to sell alcohol uh, before 10 o'clock? He says, uh, in France, it's the same. But why can, can't we operate websites? Uh, because it's the same in uh, Faroe Islands that were initiated in 1960. So uh, you cannot oppose to that. There is a, uh, there's an example somewhere in the Western world. Black would get miserable if you did have a change of government. Do you think it would be easier for the one to uh, Sure, definitely, but it will take some time yeah. because there are many other institutions to fix before that. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, yeah. Uh, I mean, there is, no, there is nothing that uh, keeps you from drinking, uh, even on the street, maybe, but uh, you feel the pressure. There are many examples we can talk about. It's not perhaps just worth saying it's a very timely consideration because big elections going on in Turkey. Yeah, we are just right now. Two yeah. elections now. Yeah. Yeah. So it was that close, but we lost again. Uh, so there's a second round uh, next week. It's all 
say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you keep going to forty. I mean, I've been watching the news on here for two days, so I know about the minister. Uh, I think she's going to resign so because of the speeding yeah. tickets. I mean, that's so funny for us, you know, because just one week ago, I mean, uh, Erdogan was showing a deep fake video in a rally attended by 1.7 million people, showing the opposition leader shaking hands with a terrorist group hat that was fake. But I mean, he showed it as it was true. So we are coming from such a vector. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I will just mention for 10 minutes about uh, the situation in Turkey now, overall. Uh, we are the sixth largest grape producer in the world, uh, producing more than 4.2 million tons of grapes. That's too much, actually. But we are only using 3% of this for winemaking. The rest, uh, we either eat fresh, uh, turn into the masses, uh, we dry them, we are the world leaders in raisin production, or we also make uh, the most favorite drink of Turks, directly out of fresh grapes. The total production is less than uh, 1 million hectoliters, making us somewhere between Uruguay and Canada uh, in the production of wine. The share of exports is very small, 3% again, by volume, and by value it is just 8.5 million pounds, and that's it. Same value as just 1,200 cases of 2010 shuttle <laughs> uh, The consumption per head is less than one liter, which includes all the hotels uh, attended by the Russian tourists in the Mediterranean. And uh, we have only 185 wineries. So just for comparison, you have uh, 197 wineries in the UK now, uh, with just 3,758 hectares. But in Turkey, we have... more than 400,000 hectares, uh, with just 185 producers. And there are no... Uh, protected designations of origin. It's self-regulated in Turkey. The Ministry of Agriculture is not interested at all uh, about these. Uh, but we have a very good collection vineyard uh, in the Trace, in a province called Tekirda, where we have almost close to 1,500 different varieties. And, uh, are, I think they have close to seven or eight uh, Sabia Uno uh, wines for each yeah. variety. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a very serious six. Uh, yeah. Yeah. six wines yeah. per variety. And there was a, a DNA uh, testing uh, for 1,150 of them and 850 of them were found to be separate varieties. Of course, these are not, not all of them are uh, used for winemaking. Uh, most of them are table grains, apparently. Uh, wine grapes published in 2012 mentions about 26 varieties used for winemaking in Turkey in 2012. Today the number is 60. In 2022 vintage we had 60 local varieties. And next room you will have 28 of them. Uh, you will have a chance to sample. Uh, similarly, OIB, uh, Uniscun Institute mentions about uh, similar varieties, 1,075 in the case of Uniscreen, 709 uh, for OIB, and also the study in Adelaide University by Kim Anderson and Sigmund Nadian mentions about 35 varieties used for winemaking in Turkey, including the international ones. So this is the uh, list now, and in the brackets you will see the corresponding wines over there in the other room. So we have, out of this 60 wines, uh, varieties, we have 28 of them coming from old wines. Because some of them uh, do not have uh, old vineyards, uh, they are coming from young vineyards. Uh, so uh, the figure is 60 now. It shows that there is an interest, because it didn't start like that. The modern Turkish winemaking that started in the 1990s were based around international varieties. 
This is the uh, great profit world map Turkey, so the distribution of the vineyards is mainly in the Aegean because of the variety Sultanine, which is used mainly for uh, making raisins, uh, it's Thompson seeds. Uh, but we have a wine, uh, and the winemakers here today, uh, Jose. Uh, so we have a, a wine made out of Sultanine grapes, and many people say uh, in Turkey that you cannot make decent wine out of this variety, but you will see for yourself. Uh, why have we been talking about all these uh, vineyards, 400 and 10,000 hectares now? Because we are losing them at a great pace. So uh, we are fifth in the world in the area under wine. But we are leading the world as well. In the pace that we are losing these vineyards, it's now 2.7%. Whenever I renew this presentation, it's another 10,000 hectares or so. I just did this uh, the other day. It was 419 hectares uh, last year. Now it is 410,000 hectares under one. So, within the last 34 years, we lost 170,000 hectares of vineyards. This is important because all these vineyards are uh, home to uh, native varieties. It's not Cabernet Sauvignon's or Laros. They are very fresh, they are very young vineyards in Turkey. What we are losing are uh, local varieties when we lose vineyard areas. Uh, 170,000 may just sound like a normal figure. So, just for comparison, it is 15% more than the total vineyard area of Australia, the world's fifth largest wine, uh, wine producer. Or 35 percent more than the total vineyard area of South Africa, 17% uh, more than the vineyard area of each of these countries, Greece and Germany, and equal to the total vineyard area of Hungary, Austria, and Georgia combined, just in 34 years. Uh, and this is constant, I mean, the pace that we are losing these vineyards is constant. Uh, only within the last four years, uh, the vineyard area that we lost equals to the total vineyard area of New Zealand. Uh, so why did we focus on this uh, not very well known region in the trees called Chamakkale, the wines of which you are about to taste? Because this is the area that we search within Turkey, this is the area that is losing the vineyard area the most. So, uh, just some geographical information. This is a province in the uh, northwest of Turkey. Uh, and in Turkey, uh, as there are no designations, uh, we just uh, give the regions uh, about the uh, vineyards according to the geographical regions. We have seven of them, and they are named after either the sea uh, that they are neighboring or their position within Anatolia. So we have Central Anatolia, the Black Sea region, the Mediterranean, Southeast Turkey, Eastern Turkey, the Aegean, and Thrace. So this region is uh, on Western Thrace, but it is normally called North Aegean in Turkey. So there are 14 different uh, provinces within Çanakkale, and uh, the region that we focused on is Bayramic, uh, where most of the vineyards are. This is landlocked, this is uh, one of the landlocked uh, provinces within Çanakkale, and this is uh, where uh, we have the border with the neighboring province called Balıkesir, and there are the Ida Mountains. So historically also this region is very important because this is the area where the uh, Gallipoli War was fought, and also the ancient war of alleged war of Troy was called as well. Also, uh, in Turkish history, it's important because there was a Canadian mining company that cut 300,000 trees in the Ida Mountains, and this is the aftermath. But the protests uh, at least stopped uh, the mine to be built. But that was the, uh, that is the region at 
an aerial view after that devastation. Uh, whenever you go to Bayerich, uh, you will most likely see such. Uh, uh, that's all taken by us, members of the heritage bodies of Turkey. Whenever you go there, you will see uprooted vineyards, uh, uprooted wines. It's very normal to uproot them due to many reasons that I will pass to you them to talk about. Um, I'll just go through very, very briefly through the research findings because you have the books and you can read them through. But just to give you the headlines and uh, just to briefly show uh, how the uh, region was in, uh, an influence uh, with so many things of you know cluster of uh, issues or pro problems like the domestic uh, migration because people are not having enough economic returns from agriculture and their land. Or also uh, the grapevine uh, area uh, was uh, giving all the, the, the vineyard owners uh, were giving their wines, uh, the, the grapes, to the uh, plants of uh, brandy, uh, which was owned by the monopoly until 2004. The monopoly was privatized uh, and uh, the uh, brandy plant, which was uh, a source of uh, place for all the vineyard owners to give their grapes, was shut down in 2007. So that was a kind of big uh, going down uh, for them to what to do with these wines as well. But it's not only that. The government, there was a big new nursery uh, for the you know sustainability and the future generation of uh, vineyards. So they shut down that one as well in 2008 and the, the vineyard owners are left alone. So, I mean, there are a cluster of issues going on here, and it's a kind of example uh, for us to see. Uh, this research that we did uh, took us like four months, uh, pre-research, the field research, and writing the, you know, the report. Uh, so it's like about the understanding uh, of the changing dynamics, what's going on here in the characterization of the vineyards, the vineyard growers condition, and uh, this is a reflection of uh, other regions of Anatolia, as I said. Um, so we did like uh, the field research in last year during the harvest time almost, uh, like within a month. It was a, a cooperation with the agricultural directorate of that region. Uh, and he went basically to each one of the 36 villages, each one of the sites, uh, each one of the parcels, and we recorded through the satellite each one of the parcels and uh, we recorded their age, their characteristics, whether they are irrigated, whether uh, they are owned by who, all these kind of things. We have a huge database at the moment. Um, and uh, we also uh, took the results uh, in the report as you will see. So as I was mentioning, again, you can see the reflection of the decrease in the vineyard areas here as well, like we 3% of the vineyards uh, was going uh, went down for the last 10 years. Uh, there is uh, the, the record at the moment that we made, uh, 1,631 vineyards uh, at that area. And, um, it, and the owners, uh, most of them, they have like two, uh, two three small vineyards. Uh, the thing is that uh, one of the also very critical uh, things that we, we uh, recorded is that the vineyard zones uh, is owned by almost gardens. It's like less than one hectare. It's not a big vineyard that will uh, result in economic value. So they own this, they still keep it, but uh, in order for them to generate value, they have to create a you know, quality uh, value, uh, which is not uh, going on at the moment. Uh, the age of the vineyard is very critical because you can have, you can see lots of old vineyards uh, but you cannot see new vineyards. The ages of the new vineyards, uh, are, the number of uh, new vineyards is very, very low. And for the last five years, there is no new vineyards upcoming. Which means that we're going to lose that area very soon because there is no policy from the agricultural, uh, in local, you know, regional, any kind of authorities or any association uh, over there. Uh, we produced for the first time the first viticulture map, uh, which you have it on your desk uh, for the first time. So in this uh, map, uh, each one of the parcels are uh, by village is uh, you know uh, shown, and this is the first you know cartographic map for us from Turkey. We hope to, to make it throughout Turkey all around. 
I'm not sure we can. And um, we also conducted a face-to-face -face research with the wine growers to understand the, you know, the future and uh, their own condition. Uh, they said that, uh, well, uh, they're still growing a lot of uh, domestic grapes, but the international grapes also started to merge into the region. Uh, the Corsicans, which we are going to taste today, is the most dominant grape variety still. They don't irrigate their vineyards. They just go very, very uh, few times. Uh, they are like self-made vineyards in this, uh, in this area. Uh, the uh, overall uh, uh, yield of the vineyards is very high, which also maybe made the vineyards survive uh, so far. Maybe they could have uh, uprooted it much more faster. However, the yield is too big. So, uh, because of the brandy uh, production, so they were uh, focused on more on the volume rather than the, the, uh, you know, the, quality, the quality. So we, have, we, we really want to change that. If they get some more value uh, to produce quality uh, grapes, that might be also changing uh, factor for them. Uh, they're working by themselves in the vineyards, they're themselves and their families. Uh, maybe a few neighbor villagers, not nobody else. Um, and they are very, very old, and they are getting older, and they don't have their kids with them, uh, neither going to agriculture, university, or school, or helping them, because they already left the villages. So uh, this is the situation at the moment, uh, like a multi-layer issue going on. Uh, uh, if I may interrupt, it's yeah. always the case. I mean, the owners of such old wines are always old. Uh, old people. Uh, for example, uh, we also, along with Leon, uh, have a winemaking project just supports uh, Heritage Wines of Turkey. And we were meant to buy some Beyrage grapes from the growers, and we just uh, wanted some photos from the vineyards. And they did not have uh, new generation uh, cellular phones, so they had Nokia 6110s. Uh, they couldn't send me photos of their vineyards uh, for a very long time. Uh, it's always the case. And, and the danger maybe, uh, maybe a gift for the region. Uh, there are now two irrigation dams built by the government. So uh, the vineyard owners have a chance to uproot the wines and plant apples uh, and a specific and type of peach yeah, yeah. there, which is very popular because they sell the grapes at 2.5 Turkish liras uh, per kilo, which is 10 uh, cents, cents. 10 yeah. cents mm -hmm. only per kilo. But they can sell uh, the peach at uh, twice or three times three this uh, value. So uh, because of these irrigation yeah. dams, uh, they are undecided between going on or turning to either table grapes that they can also sell at higher prices or to other fruits. Yeah, they these are. These are generally unirrigated. They yeah. are all unirrigated. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, the thing is that uh, they started to. Uh, some uh, table grape wines in their vineyards to just get some more value. Uh, so it's becoming very mixed up. And also there are issues of some of the vineyards are American rootstock because there's luxury in the region. But some of them are not because there is no nursery. So they are just flooding and they're putting themselves. So which is like a really mixed vineyard going on. Uh, plus they say that uh, we don't need too much money to uproot our vineyards to continue. If the, the price would be like 25 cents or 30 cents, they're okay with it. And uh, by the way, in the other regions of, of Turkey, uh, some wineries are paying like almost uh, more than one pound for Sauvignon Blanc uh, for a kilo. That's uh, something that I wish to also mention. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the, this is the mindset of them. It's a balance sheet. Uh, each one of the harvest time, when they get the prices from the, uh, the only, uh, the few wineries there, which are like mostly table grape producers, which they sell like bulk uh, of their uh, grapes, uh, they look at the price and they decide shall I continue or not. That kind of a balance sheet that they have in their mind. Okay, so. Uh, so uh, it's all good, I mean, uh, making this research, but it doesn't mean much in Turkey if you don't show an example. Uh, so we asked uh, a couple of wineries to help us 
in 2022 and support our project. So uh, there were only two wineries working with this variety in Turkey. So four other wineries uh, promised help and they did so. So we are tasting eight wines from six wineries today. And they are uh, Chamlija, uh, which is the number one, a prominent producer uh, in Trace, mainly making uh, Bordeaux wines out of Carrara Sauvignon. So they are brilliant wines, by the way. But uh, he promised, surprisingly, to help us with number one. Uh, Heraki, uh, the owner and winemaker of which is uh, here, Jose, uh, also contributed. Pasheli, uh, this is one of the wineries that exists. I mean, he was the pioneer, actually, uh, working with this grape. He introduced Hadassah's grapes to Turkey in the first place. So he also helped us. Sula, again, after Pasheli, but they were making wines. Um, and they were uh, also important because they made a sparkling, they made a blanc de noir out of this grape, and also different renditions of Karasekis. They aged Karasekis in uh, barrels, which you can find in the other room as well. this is our winery by Lebon, and they are just uh, producing very limited amounts of wine to support very good wines of this. And Yididi Geler, uh, based in Izmir, Selçuk, uh, they also made a wine. Uh, in the last, uh, the sixth, number six wine uh, out of Karasekis. So this is also a first. I mean, there are not such collaborations in Turkey. So just, so just to kind of pick up on that. So having got the research project underway, <laughs> located some really good vineyards, good fruit, they then mobilised their winemaking winery network. So the wines in this tasting are very much that most of them are here because of the research that they didn't just want the research just to stop at the, the beautiful research yeah. you know that is so a lot of these wines are kind of um they're like prototypes or you know the first release and as um, as you might mention actually all of them apart from the first wine are actually um pre bottlings so <laughs> they've been um, bottled for this tasting, so it's you're really kind of tasting and very very beginning of like a, a resurgence for these for this variety. Uh, because the, uh, that is the uh, basic uh, idea behind heritage wines of Turkey. We just want to show an example by making wine and show both the consumers and the winemakers that there is this potential, starting with Bayernich, but also our project uh, working with many different. Uh, varieties. We just want to show that these vineyards and these grapes are over there. Just use them uh, instead of using international grapes because there are a great potential in Turkish vineyards and we should, unless we use that potential, we will be losing them all. So, uh, before we stop talking, we just want to mention about other viticulture areas in the region. Just a couple of yeah. minutes yeah. because these, uh, some of these varieties you will find in the next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are like, as Mike had mentioned, 28 indigenous varieties. Three uh, actually uh, international varieties, but they came to Turkey in 50s, 1950s, which became like the terroir to them, which are Semillon, Game, and Carignan. Uh, and these are like 50 old wines, uh, 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 about 35 years old. And there are 18 collaborating uh, wineries, which is great for us. Uh, uh, so these are the regions, uh, just to see the pictures uh, from the uh, different zones, which is south part of Turkey. Turkey is a big country. And uh, this is Middle Anatolia from Cappadocia. Yeah, wine number one in the Opera yeah. coming from Cappadocia, Wines. And these are Irish curses from 1,700 plus. Uh, altitudes from the east, far east part of Turkey. They are ungrafted. Yeah, they are ungrafted. Uh, so this is uh, Mount uh, Hassan looking to the old wines together with Sabiha and the uh, Galveri winery owner Udo. Uh, so it's uh, number 1933. This is the Iraqi border, by the way, in Shurnak. Uh, so the Ungrafted, very old, hundred plus years old uh, wines uh, from that area. The, the name of the grapes are so unknown even to Turkish people. 
as well? Uh, the reason why is because uh, we all have been uh, to these minyan areas, and these guys uh, looking quite Turkish uh, by their face, actually, speak a very different language among each other. So when I asked them, uh, what language uh, is this that you are speaking? Is it Arabic? Because it sounds like Arabic. But they said, no, it's uh, not Arabic, it's Aramaic. Uh, it is, yeah. So it's not only the Vinyas that are old. I mean, where on earth do people speak Aramaic? This is why yeah. it's important, because they basically hold these cultures. Yeah. Uh, and I asked the guy, Marcus, uh, oh, are they the ancient language of uh, Jesus Christ? And he said, oh, Jesus Christ is just a boy. And we are serious. So the world all really means much more than that. And by the way, uh, one other thing. I mean, uh, that's a good slide to mention this. Or, or maybe can we pass to the... Yeah, I'm done. Next slide. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, so these are our royal trees in Bodrum. Yeah. Uh, the wines are here, 29 and 42. Yeah. These are from the exchange of people to time. Yeah. So, come and see you. From Trace. From Trace. Yeah. Also, southeastern Turkey. This is the earthquake region, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's the, almost the center. We don't have wine. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, uh, ancestral wines from Konya, a very unexpected place in central Anatolia as well. Uh, 11 and 13, two whites. Uh, the one that I wanted to mention was Beylerce, actually. It's also wine number seven, I think. Uh, we were just uh, buying in grapes from uh, that area. And the guy told us that the wines are 25 to 30 years old. And we said, ah, oh, they should be about 35. So I said, okay, let's try. So we bought one ton uh, of Beylerce grapes, which is Begleri or Trap Satiri, same, same variety, by the way. So uh, we just bought in the uh, grapes. We made the wine that we will be tasting in the next room. And this year we were just about to print the labels. So on the labels we showed the age of the vineyard. So I called him again. He already sold the uh, grapes anyway. And uh, sorry, what was the age of the vineyard? And he said they are 80 years old. <laughs> they just want to hide. They just want to, because uh, they think that as they get old, uh, the quality and the uh, yield decreases a lot. So that's the uh, main understanding in Turkey. They just want to keep it as a secret. They just don't want to tell. Yeah. So thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So let's taste the wines. We would really like to, to come this as a, you know, as an interactive session. Um, and um, also, Captured wines. I just want to say, as a bit of context, um, I don't know if many of you um, had a, a chance to try a lot of wines in Turkey, but there was a real trend for these very intense, um, deeply coloured, kind of um, impressive, but not necessarily um, kind of lovable. There was a big kind of look at my massive wine sort of thing going on. Um, and I think what's really compelling about these wines is how they are intense, but they are so fresh and balletic and um, with a really kind of ethereal perfume. And I think so exciting when you consider lots of these are basically prototypes. I mean, the first wine, I think, is very much a finished wine. And I think you can really tell. Um, so should we talk about the first wine together? Could you just kind of something about the grip? Yes. 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 We think that there are two different cones of it in the Bayramich area because uh, there are some with just thicker skins giving more color, as you will see in the setup here, uh, especially number six and uh, number uh, three and four. Yeah. Uh, they are how they look like. This is the grape. It looks like grape. Yeah, they are pretty proud. Also, uh, in the book, page 
which processes is a description of the variety as well. So uh, it's right on the mid September, but there's a reason why the harvest, harvest always starts in September the 15th, because uh, there's a huge winery there which makes uh, the stable wines, but uh, they announce the price in the 15th of September. And so everybody works until then, and then they start picking, which lasts like uh, two weeks uh, in the region. But before that, I, I mentioned there are only two wineries, Pacheli and Sula, the wines of which are included here. Uh, they made wine uh, out of these uh, grapes from several different villages. But uh, starting with this project, there are wines, apart from the Sula wine, they are all coming from a specific village. So especially eight and uh, seven, uh, which are our wines, they were made by Jose under the same uh, vessels, <laughs> same winemaking, but coming from two different villages, one from Chavushu, one from Kose. Uh, it's considered to have moderate to very fresh acidity. Um, uh, always high alcohol. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's why it was used for that brand. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it can have tannins, uh, depending on the wine, but uh, medium, uh, medium fast tannins, we can say. Uh, and the main belief is that it doesn't produce quality wine. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't age. And it doesn't age. That's the main goal. Yeah. We have not seen actually the <laughs> so we don't know. Also. And it's uh, quite a high yielding yeah. yeah. So in the testing, Sheet, you will also find a map showing the different uh, villages, and also in the tasting sheet, sheets, the villages are donated uh, for you to see. Cherry, if you are familiar with that fruit. 
it's more savory. Uh, and uh, maybe one thing uh, in general about Turkey that we should mention, because uh, you said, which is a very nice one, that it is a reset about Turkish wine in general, the other group, or this project. Because uh, there's a turning point in Turkish wine making, which is 1923, when there was a forced population of the Armenian and the Greek minorities. And they were sent to their uh, countries, and the Turkish people living in Greece were sent to Turkey. So all the people uh, tending these vineyards and making wine out of them were forced away from their vineyards. So uh, almost overnight, Turkey lost that winemaking tradition, uh, all the rituals, all the festivities, overnight. So uh, we kept some of the vineyards because we are using the grapes for other purposes, but uh, it was quite a shock. And before that, in, uh, we have records of 1904, where Turkey produces 340 million liters of wine. And in 1923, the record shows that it was only 2 million uh, hectoliters. So that was a huge damage to Turkish winemaking. We almost lost all our heritage, all our memory about wine growing and wine making. So uh, when we uh, came back uh, in the 1990s with the understanding of making quality wine, it was international grapes. Uh, we had two companies that were uh, leading the uh, efforts, and they were all planting international varieties, their own vineyards, chateau style wineries within the vineyards. So that set an example for the rest of the followers. So many Turkish wineries followed that path, uh, planting international varieties. So when you first came in, I would love to uh, start out. <laughs> so, um, I, I will. I, I love this wine. I love, and I'm not just saying that because you're here. I love it. <laughs> it has a Amaro character, that lovely sort of um, sweet sour, you know, in that really appetizing way. I also think the texture is really uh, succulent in this wine. I think it has a really kind of lovely silky um, sort of flow across the palate. It's actually quite different to wine number one. I mean, it's in a way I find it more um, not I don't, like playful. It's more like it's opening conversation. You know, it's got a very like succulent, lively, um, kind of a perky <laughs> character. I think the acidity is really lovely in this wine. I love the bright, dancing acidity. It really kind of taps through the palate. Um, I mean, I, I think I've got a familiar friend who was very smashable. <laughs> that kind of, that kind of um, character. Do you, I mean, what do you think? I really like this. It's very savory. It is very savory. Yeah, it's kind of like you might be saying, it's almost got a kind of um, a savory character or um, a delicate pepper. Mm. Um, a fresh red pepper. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it reminds me of. You know, when they're really fresh, they're Thank you. Fruity kind of the idea, it was the first experience with this grape variety. Mm -hmm. So th the goal, it was just to, to, to take all the joyful of the grape, what mm -hmm. can be done. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. And it's like uh, to be very transparent, with the, very mm -hmm. respectful with the fruit, you know, about that. So yeah. in, in, more in particular, it, it was like 100% whole bunches. So it should be like it's, uh, it's 100% uh, the natural yeast of, of that. Um, it was a couple of weeks of fermentation and it was the maturation, it was in a ovoid tank, like egg-shaped tank also, so it's maybe it's this savory also. It helps is the all the solids being in contact with that, but this is 100% un-oak wine. And it's, it's, you should mention that it's only 900 bottles. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> it was as first try, so yeah. okay. okay. <laughs> Sure, sure, yeah. of course. Yeah. 
that's the point. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. Every, yeah. every other winery that's contributed to say that, including John, that they will make Carasek and Wines. So it was a little bit like, it was the first vintage, it was like blind eyes, you know, we are coming through, so, but anyway, I mean, we didn't scare about that, so it's like, it's beautiful project, so very happy to, yeah, to so be part and thanks to, so to them. That, I mean, yeah. you were there to harvest, I was there to harvest yeah. our wines, and then you went to your own winery, uh, with the grapes, yes. made one, and then Most jumped to on the plane. Way. 1,000 kilometers away to, yeah. 1,000 kilometers to our wine in 20 hours. How much did you pay for the kilo? Tell us about it. I mean, the, the cost of that. Cost, yeah. Cost. Do you know? It's cost no. more than the transport. Yeah, yeah sure. Ah, yeah. Yeah. It's always cost more. So the production cost, the highest one, is ah. not, by far, is not the grapes. I mean, it's, it's like, it's like yeah. about six, the aim to do this. Six, eight. Eight. And the thing is, I think this, this grape is for us uh, because we have such a hot summer and we have so many savory dishes in a hot summer. So I think it's the perfect thing to look because we have so many very, very big muscle red grapes as well. So, I mean, to me, it's a really big, uh, you know, summer wine. Uh, you <laughs> can chill. A bit chill. By the way, if you are familiar with Turkish grapes, most of the reds are either kara something or something kara. Black. Kara is black. Kara means black. So uh, this is a very funny example because the etymology is kara means the black chewing gum. There's no explanation <laughs> what translates as the black chewing gum. Uh, the uh, Greek minorities that uh, tended these wines are made out of wine of them called is Marble Palli. Marble Palli. Uh, we tried to find a Greek uh, version of it and, and we sent the uh, pictures at least of the wines uh, for a uh, correspondence and they said it uh, looks familiar with Limiola from Greece. Then we gave up because Limiola is botanic compared to this variety, but it almost is identical to the wines, the grapes, bunches, but it's uh, definitely not the same. So number three and four comes from Pasheli, uh, who introduced this variety, who believed in this variety in the first place. Level, I think, uh, say it makes, Pasheli makes wine out of Karasikas for the last 10 years, even more. Yes, maybe 10, 10 years more. Yeah, he has been working on this variety for 10 years. So uh, number three and number four uh, are coming from uh, old vineyards uh, from the same village called Gedik. I think it's the second uh, village with the highest amount of vineyards. A little bit higher than uh, Chomsky. It's 300 meters in altitude. Uh, the difference is uh, in number four, four there's only 4% of narrow, which he started. So he started like this, so uh, in 6N. Uh, by the way, uh, if you look at the label 6N, it's a uh, play of words in Turkish. Uh, in Turkish, uh, it is uh, altına hayır, uh, which means no to gold. It's mm -hmm. a protest against that mining, Canadian mining company. So when you say 6N, does that sound like something in Turkish? Uh, in Turkish, it sounds like Altı, altı is 6 in Turkish, yeah. but altı is gold. So, uh, uh, there is no gold. Yeah. Not to gold, oh, altı okay. rahayı, not to gold. Okay. You cannot say it, you cannot protest openly, because then you would be... You, you cannot know. put the label. Uh, what would happen if you, if you protested openly? Uh, that that you mining ask. company yeah, uh, uh, is a friend of the government, so... Right. Is it still operational? No. no. Uh, it was ended. At least we were successful in a front line. But they cut all the trees. The damage was done. Because the government sells or gives uh, the uh, underground of the land uh, separate from the overground of the land. So there is this huge area of uh, olive trees in that area as well. They are giving to the mining companies underground of the olive tree area. So there is. 
Actually, that point is very strong in terms of coming together and progressing and pushing things out. So that's how they managed to kind of so far keep the things of their Point number three and four were fermented with native yeasts. And I, I think number four has been, um, it's actually quite widely distributed in sort of London on trade. It's imported by a grass wine company, Nick Darlington and um, his team. And um, Nick's been a really early champion of this wine. Actually, this, they're a super importer. Um, and I see this wine listed actually in quite a few restaurants. It, and it goes really well with sort of that kind of almost the Ottolenghi cookbook style of food, you know? So, um, again, it has something in it that I find it um, really nicely, most paradoxical. You know, it has this quite ethereal, floral, savory perfume. Um, and then a really nice little, just, just enough resistance on the palate. It's interesting to try number three, which is 100% Marsepis against number four, which has got a little bit of Merlot. And Stratford. Yes. And in a way, um, I, think I, I love the, the slightly scratchier texture of number three. <laughs> it's got Grenache, Grenache, Grenache star scratchiness. And then number four has got that kind of buffed, polished yeah. um, feel to it. And uh, funnily, I mean, uh, for the Turkish market, it was first made uh, for the Turkish market, plus of all, that edition of Merlot, which is nothing, uh, but it was just there on the label, Karasakız and Merlot, so that the Turkish consumers would be familiar with that wine. It's such an irony. Yeah, they will buy from the Merlot, not from the Karasakız. Turkish. That's the way everyone. works. No, the is more tight on the There's no mention of the I think said that actually where he really found this wine being successful in Turkey was after it was successful in exports. So I think he's going to be very successful with this wine. You know, it's small production, but listed in smart places in the UK and in the US. And actually he found that after he was getting that kind of validation from export markets, it then helped him to be able to actually sell it in Turkey. Yeah. So they always have to go, you know, they kind of get the, the validation from abroad, and then say, actually, you do realize that, that our varieties are, are also worthy of attention and, and uh, capable of top quality. Yeah. Number five is, uh, comes from Sula, uh, the other winery that has been using this variety in different renditions that you will find in the other room. So this is the year 2022. They were uh, not willing to send this because uh, this was just bottled uh, maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So they just, I think they were worried that we would be unkind to it. So let's just remember this is a little baby. <laughs> Um, and um, I mean, super make um, great wines. And they've been a producer, they've always championed native varieties. Yeah, uh, to a certain extent that they have seven wines in the other coming from different native varieties, all wines. This is their basic process, they have a reserve one. Aged in oak, and they have a ground reserve one aged for in what? 12 months in yeah. New York, which is. Uh, <laughs> and this was the sparkling one, yeah. which is down in our, which is. Yeah. Was this one? They, they really committed it to Curse of the So, So, actually, I think we could have chilled it a bit further this one. Mm -hmm. um, and I think. Um, Again, this has that lovely kind of, kind of bittersweet, savoury 
um, fruit. Um, and that um, nice brightness. Um, I like the fact that it's very unadorned. <laughs> it's just very um, sort of very transparent fruits, but with this kind of this savory. It's not again a hint of that kind of yeah. There might be slightly of yeah, You know what I mean? That texture where it has some this that I think a bit of a nice sort of scratchiness. On the palette, um, I think that's actually showing very well. So, when do you think we'll be back in a, in, a, in a few months? This one, yeah, in a few months. In a few months, yeah. 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 In yeah. 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 <laughs> so, the uh, alcohol level of the wine so far was decent. The first one was 15 percent alcohol, the second one is 13.5, uh, the third one is again 13.5. Uh, the fourth one is thirty point five. And this one allows you to yeah, thirty point five. Yeah. <laughs> so, any comments or questions about any of these first uh, five wines? So wine number six. Yeah. Uh, six is made by uh, Yedi uh, who produced also a champion of uh, native varieties, but he tried kind of this for the first time. Uh, just to show you uh, the different winemaking, number six and number seven come from the same part, uh, the opening picture, if you remember, because the uh, Karasakis uh, leaves turn to a brilliant orange, starting from October. Uh, number six and seven comes from this one. Uh, it's all linear, by the way. Uh, but different styles of winemaking. I mean, number seven was made by Posa again uh, in a clay pot, but number six was made in stainless steel, but coming from the same area, same grapes. Uh, the alcohol content is 14%. For both of them. No, 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 this one. Number six. Oh. Number six was fermented with cultured yeasts and seven by native yeasts. No. Like a kind of um, like a sort of squished egg. Yeah. Like yeah. This. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. These two. Mm -hmm. 
something with number seven, the other is number eight. <laughs> Again, this is introduction. So, my judging, judging by the photo, that's the capacity a person can handle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very smashable. So, um, my number, uh, what I find really interesting about these two lines is how they um, express the tannins of the variety in two very different ways. So, wine number six, I think, is much more a sort of um, a profile. Yeah, it's very integrated, isn't it? And kind of um, harmonious and, and succulent all the way through. Um, and it really, I think, um, has a, almost quite an ambassadorial style. You know, it's made in, a, in a, a really kind of, um, yeah, quite seductive, um, very well integrated, um, quite, um, I mean, there is resistance in tannin, but it's it's quite sort of um, buffed, you know. Um, and, um, and then I, so it's like the tannins are being like scribbled through the mind. And then what I love about number seven is again the sense of it's like a, you know, it's got a real rhythm, a real kind of snappy freshness, um, and a kind of nice like, lovely little whiplash of tannin on the on the finish. Um, so I, you know. We're all interested, because we're here, on the diversity of different grapes and the value of um, fine diversity for climate change, drought resistance, but actually, the, the, if you're working on a project like this, the wines they make must be beautiful and interesting. So, you know, it can't just be a, a kind of a curiosity. Um, and, um, and I think that Actually, the I mean, all of these wines I think have an innate, tasty value <laughs> of their own, and I think this kind of freshness in reds um, is becoming more and more of an important quality in wine. And you know, we used to have an idea of also almost like a, a bit of a binary <laughs> idea of what wine styles are in the sense of whites you know, reds, and, and have you noticed how all of these ideas with what a wine is, is starting to change. So you have amber wines, rosé that are becoming more dark and gastronomic, reds that are becoming really very much about um, vibrancy and freshness and acidity. And, um, and I personally, I love that about, um, about wine, and I think we should keep embracing that, that, that kind of real diversity in your idea of what can be beautiful and, and how it can be. So, um, I love tasting these two wines together. I think it was really, um, really interesting. What, what did you think of them? I'd love to ask about four. Why is four named? This is so unusual. Why number four? Um, yeah. uh, no, there's oak. There's three months yeah. of oak. Uh, used oak. Uh, to follow in that. It's a mix of 96% and it's just 4% of narrow. Fermented with. Uh, natural yeast. Partially got barely for eight months. Eight? No, it's, it's, not, no, no, it's, it's not three. three. No, but that's number three you've got. She's asking about number four. Number four. Six so, which is six Six and Oh, right. A special six and Yeah. I always find that the plastic smell is always there. It's a bit It's like a It's a bit like a bit like <laughs> I think what is for me is like it's also important to approach them with the mind that my it's a new variety that we are not necessarily used to be tasted. So you will be picking up aromas and flavors that doesn't necessarily exist in the memory. Um, so there is always a new Introduction in terms of the yeah. 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 uh, I said it's like a plastic uh, ball, and then when it goes flat, you just cut it out and use it as a hand when you go to the shower. And you said it smells like the uh, bark of a watermelon. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Chef's day off. <laughs> Can I tell you, we did have someone registered for this. Um, <laughs> so, 
Pacheli winyards are the ones which are in 500. Yeah. 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 Ours is at 300. This 8 number, number 8 is in 310, 320 mm -hmm. there. <coughs> I, might, I might admit, if you get the information, <laughs> within this area, uh, what are the general soil structure? Is there any data on that one? Uh, it changes. I mean, it's basically, uh, it's basically clay, of course, but there's granite as well. The, so the, uh, the rock is granite. Uh, in our vineyard, you can find lots of granite uh, everywhere. But uh, it's a sandy clay. Uh, yeah, sandy. It's, it's generally a sandy clay. Uh, but the main rock bedrock is granite. It also changes from, like, there is a river, and where, for example, number seven is, it's very like more clay, but for example, in number eight, where our winery is, it's 80% sand. Yeah, yeah. yeah sandy, loamy, yeah. and there's only like little bits of clay. Mm -hmm. yeah. But fluxuring sure is there, so yeah. all the wines are grafted. So we try to just to give them, make the same thing. Uh -huh. So everything is the same apart from wine. Yeah. The seven and eight is just the vineyard. It's like the hay. Same capacities, yeah. all nature of yeast. Oh, it seems to be like some difference between the grapes also. We are like the clone difference. So we have, I mean, to research and still working on that. But the, the looking of the grapes, they were the same grape, but the, as you see the color in the eight one, it was much more dark. In the other one, they have much more, also like a white, pinky grapes on the panses. But it's fully distilled when you put it in the opera, it's fully distilled? These years, yes, this is fully distilled. Oh, it have, it, there are some stems that come in, we can consider like maybe 10% of the stems. And um, it's really, I find really fascinating to compare the, to, you know, contrast the two different um, tannic profiles of those two wines that we make. Just because um, you see it's the same variety, same vintage, the same winemaker. Same harvest Same harvest <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, I really love that, like that sense of... Um, yeah, there's a bit more resistance in wine number eight. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost like the tannins have got a really lovely aromatic, like, soaking in them. I think um, um, 
I find that really appetising um, and really intriguing. And I think, um, I mean, really, when you consider all of these wines are essentially approached heights, they've been slightly um, rushed out to kind of come and meet us for this um, event. But I think, I think we're right to do what we're doing because, you know, I think it would be a shame if we were never to be able to taste anything. You know, especially from Turkey. And we've got Ben here who you sell um, quite a few Turkish wines. Um, and I, you know the cliche, sorry, I've got you with your <laughs> boys. But I think you, you know the cliche wines, don't you? You sell yeah. those wines. There's yeah. very well sold through food, so Mediterranean dining, and suggesting yeah. through that. And then customers coming in who've been to Greece and that area and want to try something else from the region, yeah. they naturally. I mean, they're usually looking for something a bit weird if they come into our shop anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> and do you think you know, having tasted this profile as a seven is something that has appeal and of interest? Yeah, you just have to set it up in the right way with the customer because it's so different from you know what they're used to drinking. So I think if you lead them into it or you trade them up to it, they, they like trying something new. Um, and I've even found going through these, the second taste, I'm getting more and more into it than the first. So it's yeah. a slight transition period for the English palate, I think. Yeah. It's like Issa was saying, you always have to build up your own internal lexicon, because in a way it's, it's really hard to define something until you've named it. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and, well, I mean, I love that. It's like constantly learning new sort of flavour languages, isn't it? Um, well, um, to say anything else? any more questions or comments on, on those? I wanted to ask a question about, you know, I look at the map, yeah. and it's so interesting when I look at all of these different vineyards and their altitude, and then slightly to the south east you have a peak, Kabatas Peak. So, you know, the closer you come to this to the peak, the, the altitude starts creeping up. Do you think... Uh, you know, in the future, people might start sort of planting some vines closer to a higher altitude and exploring what an altitude a variation might give to the same vine. It's a very deep forest, actually. Oh, so it's it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's yeah. the Ida Mountains, and that was all. Oh, yeah, it's all green and yeah. Uh, mm. mm. uh, huge vine uh, gold mining company, and I think it's not possible. I mean, it's all good. Yeah, so yeah, that's for it's not likely. Yeah. 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 And versions of because there are certain woods that um, have a kind of an anti um, microbial effect. Yeah. 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 Um, so, like terrapin tree as well, I think. Yes. Well, so, yeah. so actually, um, and this is even <coughs> happening in um, Montalcino, you know, which is not known for its high level of uh, romanticism. Um, I, think, I think there might be something else there. It's a prob problem at the moment throughout the world, increasing our wine levels because of the weather yeah. changes. The arboreal wines, because of the way the nutrients are dispersed within the grapevine, are more suitable to reduce the alcohol level and make wines with lighter alcohol levels. There is added benefits other than just the Congo, which is high density. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought of a couple of things, but I don't think you thought that one. So, um, I just, well, I'll start to wrap up because we've got some amazing wines to taste next door. But I'd just like to thank Kim, Kumar, Gojda, Sabiha, Ravan, 
um, be open to this collaboration. We've known each other for a long time, and I was really delighted we were able to do this. I'd also really like to thank the IWSC Foundation. We have Tristan here from IWSC for really believing in this, and you were one of the first um, to give us um, a grant. And you know, you can imagine being someone who we want to support this project to, to research and make a prototype of, um, of wines from Turkish <laughs> Karazakis. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it can seem a little bit esoteric, but it's so important that we, I mean, support these kind of projects because this is where I think the interest and the diversity and also the resilience of uh, the wine industry comes from, you know. And, um, I also would really like to thank um, Isa and the team at Trivet for holding us here. Isa has an incredible Turkish wine selection here. Um, just goose. Not just. <laughs> it's everything, but I love his list because it starts with the origin of wine first. So it starts with Turkey, Georgia, and Armenia. Um, and, um, and also my colleague Belinda, who's done a fabulous job. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, This, the equivalent of this project for our next year, which I think is going, well, it is going to be in, in Chile. We're going to be working with producers whose old vines were affected by the wildfires. Um, a similar sort of project, so research that is applied and published and um, stimulates and shares interest and knowledge. And tied to um, a selection of wines, so that we continue with this link of putting these these wines and all the culture and the interest that they hold into a bottle and selling it for a price that reflects the kind of the love and the quality of the wines. Please do check out www.allwines.org for more info. We also have um, a trade tasting on the 14th of June at 67 Carmel, a walk around tasting with some fantastic old fine wines from all around the world, including Turkey. Um, and it would be fabulous to see the um, details on our website. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for coming. Guru, she made our logo. Oh, and Giza and Giza here and yeah. she made the all the design of the printed uh, material. Design of all this printed material, but so passionate that she flew all the way. I would like to thank Justice Robinson, Julie Harding, and Tamlin Curran here for just inspiring us to save all vineyards, all varieties. Because it all started uh, with an email from Julia Harding. So, wine number seven is here because of her. Mm -hmm. uh, so, thank you very much.